the city county wants to sell for Side County Utilities Commission. Uh, Ms. Glenn, would you like to call the roll? I sure will. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with our chairman, Mr. Randall Tuttle. Present. Uh, our vice chairman, Mr. Wesley Curtis. Present. Commissioner Harold Day. Present. Commissioner Tom Griffin. Commissioner Yvonne Hines. Commissioner Hugh Jernigan. Present. I know I saw Ms. Hines, but Ms. Hines? Here. Okay. Here. Commissioner, yes, I heard you that time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dwayne Long. Present. Commissioner Charles, Chris Parker. Present. Commissioner Charles Wilson. Present. Commissioner Allen Younger. Present. Okay. And Commissioner Griffin, has he joined us yet? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Patrice. Uh, we're looking forward to a good meeting today with guests from Raftelis and also uh, our Solid Waste Division. And Courtney will probably introduce them as well as the rest of the city staff. Yes, thank you, Chairman Tuttle. Um, I will, as normal, and just let you know who's on the call from, from staff. So we have Damon DeCane, our Assistant City Manager, Patrice Glenn, Senior Administrative Assistant, Jan McCarg, Assistant Director of Solid Waste, Michael Stover, Assistant Director of Operations, Gordon Dively is our Solid Waste Operations Manager, Shang Chu Huffman, Capital Projects Engineer, Todd Lewis, Senior Civil Engineer, Gail Kettler and Kyra Boyd uh, with the communications team, Lisa Saunders, Chief Financial Officer, Kelly Latham, Deputy Financial Officer, Jerry Bates, Purchasing Director, Marilena Jensen Guthold, Assistant City Attorney, Jakara Restbrook, Office of Business Inclusion and Advancement. And then we have Elaine Conti, Will Kerr, and Reginald Ford, all with the Reftelis team um, as our guests. And I think I got everyone. So, um, uh, Chairman, I guess it, if you're okay, I'm just going to keep going unless you have any. Keep going, yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks. I am going to just go over a couple of quick announcements. So I'm going to share my screen very quickly before I turn it over to Raftelis. Okay. So um, after I make uh, some, a couple of quick announcements, we will present our affordability study, and then Gordon will give the solid waste disposal series. It'll be the last uh, series of the City of Winston-Salem University class that we've done over the last several months. And then we'll present the agenda items, our financial updates, water and wastewater updates, and solid waste updates. If we get to AMI, I have just a few slides, and the, the main reason to give you an update on that is that you will see an item um, on next month's agenda regarding AMI. So I wanted to, to just do a little refresher if we have time. Um, and I really want to point out, too, that we are in our 12th month of virtual meetings. I don't know if anybody realized that, but this time last year was our last face-to-face -face meeting. So March of last year was our last face-to-face -face meeting. And I don't know if you probably are like me and did not think it would, would go this long. But um, I did want to just point out how proud I am of our staff for being able to to continue with our operations and we've been able to continue our board meetings and we've just been able to persevere through, through a very challenging year. So um, yeah, I wanted to, to make that mention. A um, couple of upcoming meetings that I wanna remind you of, there's the planning and policy meeting on March 15th. So that's a week from today at 10 a.m. This will be uh, regarding our good neighbor policy, basically, uh, sewer backups in residential homes. We'll be discussing that. There's some revisions that we need to make to that policy and that will be on the April meeting. So so that that will that meeting on Monday will be to discuss that. And then on March 23rd, we'll present the capital budget plan at 1.30. Um, on the April 20th, we'll present the operations budget and rate recommendations. That's at 1.30 as well. And then on April 27th, we have a tentative meeting scheduled at 1.30. It's if needed to discuss any last minute budget decisions that we need to make. So all these will be held virtually via Zoom. 
Um, we talked a few months ago about uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. I am happy to announce that the city of Winston-Salem has formed a new div diversity, equity, and inclusion department. And um, Taisha Hinton will be leading that office. I don't, I don't know if you probably, most of you remember Taisha. She was in the Office of Business um, Inclusion and Advancement. And then about a year ago, she was promoted to the sanitation director. Um, she will uh, continue that role until they find a replacement for her. And then she'll transition into the new DEI officer. <clears throat> um, so parallel to that, our department is working closely with, with Taisha in, in this newly formed um, um, department with our own uh, request for proposal for a DEI consultant to come in and do an assessment of, uh, of utilities and look at our policies and um, you know, help with training or any other initiatives that we have um, that we need to pursue. And so that request for proposal will be posted um, fairly soon, as soon as it makes it through all the proper channels for approvals, purchasing and city manager's office. Two, two campaigns that we normally partake in. I just wanted to mention, we have Fix a Leak Week, which is March 15th through the 21st. And then um, for Scythe Creek, Re Creek Week, I can't really say that, <laughs> is March 20th through the 27th. Uh, we sponsor that event. And then we're gonna debut our water and wastewater virtual tour. So as you know, we're, we're in the pandemic where we're not doing anything face to face. So Kyra has been working hard on putting together virtual tours of our plant which I think is great and we'll be able to use them even post pandemic in a lot of different different settings in the schools. And I think it will be a, a good added asset for our department. And then um, last thing is our administrative move um, update. If you hear any noise during this meeting, it's because they are drilling and I think they're at lunch right now, but <laughs> it could get noisy. So hopefully it won't be too much of a distraction, but they're moving along. We had a progress meeting last week. Um, the contractor thinks he'll be finished in, in, in five to six weeks, which is a little bit ahead of schedule. I have a couple of pictures. They've completed most of the demo work that they've needed to do um, over, the, over the last month. And they're starting to rough in the new, you know, frame out the new conference rooms and office space. So. It's moving quite, it's, it's moving along and um, so we're getting excited. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there are any um, questions for me before we turn it over to Elaine with Raftelis. Yeah, I, I do have one question. Uh, I don't think in the, during the last couple of meetings we've talked about um, the, the, the concerns about voters from was the muddy, not muddy Creek. Um, anyway, you know, what I'm talking about Ms. Uh, Kathy Hines had raised some concerns over the last several months. What's the latest with that? I have not heard from Ms. Hines um, in several months. Uh, the, the mayor and I had a phone call with her. I, I want to say it was probably last summer sometime. Um, and you know, we explained to her all the measures that we're taking. Um, we've we've spent, uh, you know, a significant amount of, of investments. We made a significant amount of investments to make sure that we're good neighbors. But we did explain to her that there's no way to completely remove all odor, but we do everything we can to try to minimize it. And I have not heard from her since that meeting. Okay, well, hopefully it's resolved from her perspective. Right. Thanks right. for the update. Yes, yeah. you're welcome. Courtney, I've got one question. Did we ever put a weather monitoring station down at the plant down there to measure the wind directions and all and barometric pressure? We have not. Uh, I know if it if it was continued to be a problem, that could potentially be a next step. You know, I just think the prevailing we, wind. we ought to monitor it pretty close, I think. It might be part of the problem. So okay. Thank you. Anything else? I just wanted to say I appreciate how well our water treatment plants run and our redundant systems and how they're all set up. It really came to light in the last few weeks. That's exactly right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with that, I will, um, Elaine, I'm going to let you or Will, I think Will's going to share his screen.
and Elaine, you're gonna go through the, the presentation. So this, I'll, I'll just go over a little bit first. We, we decided to do an affordability study, really, um, I guess it came to light because of the pandemic. But I think it has been a good process for us to work through um, regardless. Um, and we can, you know, we need to assess ourselves and see what we're doing and see if we need to do anything different. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Elaine. Okay, well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate the opportunity to be here to, uh, to do this analysis, first of all, and secondly, to be able to um, uh, give the results to you all and, and have a discussion about this. Um, Courtney introduced us before, but again, my name is Elaine Conti. I'm with Raf Dellis, and um, on the phone with me today is my colleague, Will Carr, who you'll also hear from in a minute, um, and also on the phone from RDF Consulting Group is Reggie Ford, who also assisted us with this uh, project and has been very in instrumental in, in, um, in contacting some of these agencies that you'll hear about in a minute. So we have him on the phone too, in case there's uh, questions arise. So thanks, and we look forward to the discussion. And Will's gonna be driving it for us. So uh, he'll kind of be flipping through. Um, as Courtney mentioned, um, we actually started thinking about this. It, it, it certainly came to light more with COVID, but even before COVID, affordability has always been um, on the minds of many um, you know, cities and counties in terms of the affordability of water service. So we wanted to answer a couple of questions and that's what we intend to walk you through today. The first of which is how can utilities specifically in North Carolina address the affordability of water and sewer service? Um, second, we wanna talk about how do you determine if you have an affordability challenge um, exclusive of COVID? Uh, how do you identify um, who is at risk? That's who we term as, uh, as at risk of not being able to pay their bill and at risk for disconnection of, of water sewer service. Um, we obviously with COVID, there's, there's been an additional impact, so we wanna talk about that. And then finally, how can we help these customers now um, in the COVID environment and then post COVID? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So Will, if you'll scroll down to the next um, slide, we wanna talk in, in particular of three areas. There are really three ways, uh, three major categories of how utilities can address affordability of water and sewer service. The first is through providing bill payment options. So that means um, either assisting payments, uh, excuse me, assisting customers pay their bills. So for example, a payment plan, this is where you are not discounting the water sewer bill. What you're doing is you're just helping them give terms that can assist them in paying um, the, the bill. And that is something that is currently offered uh, by Winston-Salem for South County Utilities. So that, that is um, an option. The other way of providing bill payment options is through discounts to where you are literally reducing the customer's water and sewer bill. And that can be done through a couple of ways. Um, one is... Um, by uh, providing a, a discount. And in North Carolina, you can actually, customers cannot subsidize other customers. So the only way that you can do this without getting some type of general fund contribution is to do it through all in, volunteer, um, volunteering. So basically you can have uh, 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 connections with other agencies where they have um, funds that they can provide assistance to these customers who need um, uh, assistance paying a bill, or you can have some type of roundup program, again, a voluntary program. Currently, what part of um, the, the option is by Winston-Salem for South County Utilities is partnering with these nonprofit agencies to put customers in contact with them and to be able to get assistance that way. That's kind of the first category, and we'll, we'll revisit these again. The second is helping customers reduce their, their water bill. Um, and you can do that through leak detection. You can also do it through your leak adjustment policies. And that too, uh, leak adjustment policy is currently offered um, to, to customers. And then finally, you can address affordability through the designing of your rates. Uh, and there's really two, two areas. You look at your volumetric component and your and your fixed component. Um, and the reason you do that is the fixed component can comprise a larger portion of a water sewer customer's bill. So therefore you wanna be sensitive to that. And also tiers can assist with affordability because typically 
um, the, the first tier is at the lowest rate. And if customers can keep essential use in that tier, you can also maintain affordable rates. And both of those are currently something um, that is offered right now to water and sewer customers. Tiers as well as always monitoring that fixed versus volumetric component. To go to the next slide, what we wanna talk about now is how do you determine if you have an affordability challenge? And the way that you do this is you, you first have to define affordability. And um, historically in the water sewer industry, there was really one metric that was used and it was set decades ago by the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was really in response to, it was on the wastewater side. You had a lot of communities who were dealing with what's called um, combined sewer overflows. And in order to address those, there was a large capital investment, typically consent decrees that the EPA would impose. And um, in recognizing the need for uh, determining whether or not this consent decree was gonna be affordable, they established a metric. And that metric has been used within the industry, but as of late, as affordability has become um, more and more important topic, uh, there's been lots of other uh, metrics that have been considered. And Will is going to talk about that in, in a minute. But once you um, use a metric, then you then you get data to, to then determine how many customers at, are at risk. And, and Will is going to kind of walk us through very uh, recent development of, of a affordability metric. Great. Thanks. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Let's get into it. So like Elaine said, sort of the first step in kind of our affordability analysis was defining affordability. And what we elected to use was two measures established in 2019 um, as a white paper that was developed by the American Water Works Association, NACWA, which is the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, and WEF, which is the Water Environment Federation. Um, and this white paper prescribed two different uh, you know, affordability metrics to assess water and sewer affordability in your service area. The first is the household burden indicator, and then the second is the poverty prevalence indicator. So the HBI is, that's going to be your typical annual water and sewer bill as a percent of the lowest income quintile. So what that looks at is a total annual water sewer bill um, divided by, you know, the denominator is going to be the lowest income quintile of the bottom 20% of earners, um, you know, in your service area or in your or in census tracts, which is ultimately, you know, where we got with this analysis. Um, on the other side uh, is the poverty prevalence indicator, which looks at, uh, you know, the percentage of your service area with household income at or below 200% of federal poverty. And the way that I like to think about this is the HBI you know, we have a little more control over because we have some control over our water and sewer rates, whereas the PPI is more of a general assessment of, of um, income and poverty within sort of within the service. So the way this this affordability these affordability metrics are sort of framed up is is they're plotted on a matrix. Um, so for HBI household burden indicator, you know. If you're less than, if less, if your annual water and sewer bill is less than 7% of your low income quintile, then you're categorized as low burden. So this bottom row down here is low burden. Um, up above 10%, that's our, that's our high burden area. So, so, and then, you know, between seven and 10, it, that's the moderate burden in the medium area. Um, on the PPI, you know, less than 20%, that's going to be our low burden. And then going up kind of to the other side is, is at or above 35%. So if, um, you know, 35% of our households are, are at or below um, the 200% of FPL are falling sort of this high burden. And so where we focused our analysis on was these customers here in this high burden, very high burden um, range. So anyone above with that HBI above um, 7%, that's sort of where we where we honed in and focused this analysis. So step two was to quantify who's at risk. And 
through this analysis, we collected a bunch of information. We collected a bunch of demographic information like household income, um, statistics related to cost of living, number of people per household. Um, this was all readily available census information that we collected from the Census Bureau website. Then on sort of the Winston-Salem side, we collected customer billing information. So we collected bi-monthly uh, water and sewer bills for all of your customers, but we particularly focused on single family customers who are water and sewer uh, customers. Cause then we, you know, one, if they're single family, that means they're a direct customer of your system. So if you think about multifamily, many of those accounts will have one master meter with all of the units, you know, that sit behind this meter. And so a lot of the folks that are living in multifamily, um, you know, apartments or condominiums, um, you know, they're billed indirectly by the water and sewer provider. Um, we also wanted customers who were getting both water and sewer service so that it was a level playing field and we had an idea of the total impact of the water and sewer bill on these customers. So in terms of findings, you know, first we focused really on kind of some Forsyth County characteristics. Um, the first main takeaway that, that we wanted to highlight is, you know, your water and sewer bill is very affordable when compared against other peers in North Carolina. And I know you all monitor this, you know, pretty frequently. Um, and so you're, you're aware of this fact, but, um, you know, Winston-Salem Forsyth County is on kind of the, the lower end of the water and sewer rate um, side of things when it comes to North Carolina peers. One, data point on this chart I really like is this North Carolina median. So the median bill for water and sewer providers in North Carolina is, is well above Winston-Salem for site county, which, which is great um, for us. Um, so in addition to that, you know, we wanted to get an understanding of, of cost of living. Um, so when we started pulling some economic statistics, um, you know, from Forsyth County and some of your peers from your neighboring uh, you know, counties as well as the state and the U.S. You know, one thing we picked up on is is incomes are, you know, in general a little lower than some of our peers. I mean, especially compared to Wake County, um, but we're below, you know, the median or the middle. I guess this is the average for North Carolina and the U.S. Um, however, you know, if you look on sort of the cost side of things, you can see that the cost of living in Winston-Salem. Forsyth County is really um, better than many of these same peers. So we've got a higher owner-occupied rate in, in homes in Forsyth County than in Guilford or in Mecklenburg County where Elaine and I are. Um, median home value, um, you know, our, our home prices are a little more reasonable than in Durham County, or Wake, or Mecklenburg. Um, and then median rent is also low. So there's a couple of things going on here. The incomes you know, we generally found incomes to be a little lower, but the cost of living was also lower and that helped offset. And then when you factor in the fact that our water and sewer bills are, are also on the lower end, um, you know, all that stuff is working. So what we've done here is we've created a heat map. And what we did is, is again, we collected detailed customer billing information we we're able to assign all of this information to uh, census tracts within Winston-Salem for site count. Um, so we assigned customer billing information, you know, usage characteristics, um, as well as average water and sewer bills. And we compared that against the low income quintile in each of the census tracts. So what we've done here is we've created a heat map for that household burden indicator. Um, and when we ran that, we identified five census tracts that are at or above, you know, this 7% as prescribed, um, you know, in kind of the industry guidance. Um, and that amounts to about 3,000 single family residential customer accounts. So about three, between three and 4% of single family accounts, um, you know, single family residential um, water and sewer accounts, you know, would fall in sort of that high burden or potentially at-risk uh, customer group. Now, some interesting takeaways about these, um, 
you know, these census tracts with the higher HBI. And you can see kind of it's really these two that are that are red and orange here. Um, the one is that they've got a lower, um, you know, there's not many single family customer accounts in there. So there's probably some multifamily housing, um, you know, as well as kind of some limited single family housing within these census tracts. Another interesting takeaway is that the household size is a little, is on the higher end for these two, kind of the, the two census tracts that are at, that have sort of the highest uh, household burden indicator, which would, you know, and, and one thing we always find is that the number of people per household has typically the best correlation with how much water you use. So, you know, there's a couple of things going on here. You've got higher bills in these areas because you've got more people per household, but then also you've got lower income in these areas creating you know, these higher household burden on the Cape results. Um, so I'll pause there if there's any questions or anything or I can keep, keep going. But so, you know, I'll keep moving along and then I'm gonna kick it back to Elaine just in a second. But our key takeaways, you know, for single family residential customers using these industry measurements, um, you know, it, it doesn't appear that there's a widespread issue. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there are some single family customers that are still struggling to pay for water and sewer bills. And, and when you look at this map, you know, there's probably customers scattered throughout these green, uh, you know, census tracts that are struggling to pay their, you know, their water and sewer bill as well. But, uh, you know, in general, I think we found, again, water is priced at very reasonable, water and sewer is priced very reasonably for Site County. Uh, and so it didn't, didn't appear that there was some widespread, you know, affordability issues. One, one item we did want to flag is, is multifamily, you know, those indirect customers, again, those, they present a unique set of challenges. Again, because they're not direct customers of the system. If they are paying a water and sewer bill, you know, often um, folks in multifamily are paying their water sewer bill through rent. Um, but if they are getting a water and sewer bill, sometimes it's done by a third party provider or something. But typically, many of these multifamily properties will be on a single master. So that's a whole other kind of set of issues that, that Elaine will talk about um, here in just a few minutes. Um, but what, you know, our general takeaway is that the best opportunity to help these customers is through organizations that provide, you know, this low income communities. And so Will, 3,000 customers out of about 120 or 30, let's call that two and a half percent. Do you have any metrics industry wide for what? Oh, there you go, 3.4%, sorry. Three yeah. four, is, uh, tell me how that relates to average or median across the industry, please. Um, that's, that's a good question. And one thing I will point out, and then I'll let Elaine chime in, is we looked at just customers who were water and sewer. So our number in residential, so our number is more like 90,000. So, you know, the way we came up with 3.4 is, is it's about 2,900 on about 90,000, you know, single family residential customers who are getting both water and sewer service. Yeah, and, and in terms of knowing whether or not, you know, how does this kind of compare with, with others, this is still a, a fairly new framework. And so you're seeing a lot more utilities um, start to use this. So I think we'll have better data going forward to kind of see, you know, what, you know, what constitutes, um, you know, more of an affordability, you know, challenge. Each, each utility will also kind of, you know, even though we have this framework, they can, they can certainly choose to look at different areas within that, within that um, matrix. Um, I think, I think the key is really kind of understanding some of the, you know, the demographic information that Will was mentioning before, which is, you know, focusing on that water sewer bill is certainly really key. Um, that plays a, you know, a, a huge factor in, in knowing if you have an affordability challenge. 
I think that's what you typically see in, in, in other areas that ha have more of an affordability challenge. It's, it's, it's really that water sewer bill that's driving it a lot more than, you know, than anything else. Um, so we don't, we don't have, unfortunately have a good answer for, you know, what, how, how does this compare, to, you know, to others? Um, but, you know, this is just more of, of, of really looking at this, this kind of new framework and, and setting a, a, um, a, a a metric, if you will, for the, for your utility, so we can kind of benchmark, you know, going forward as as you continue in the future of of having to have some, you know, rate adjustments. You you can use this information to to gauge how affordability, uh, if you're continuing to have affordable affordable rates or not, and and how much of that population you may need to to continue to target and assist. So I don't know if that helps. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, Will okay. Elaine, Will Elaine, this is Wesley. I've got a quick question, uh, and maybe I, maybe I've overlooked it. I see a whole lot of green, you know, in those areas, realizing that they're not at risk as much, but there are a lot of people in that area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, given that amount of area, or are, are there some? Uh, is there some sort of addition that you can get that says, you know, who's at risk in all of those areas, and that may total to be a big number. We do, since we do it by the census track and we're really looking at that lowest quintile, you're, you're right, there, there are always gonna be folks that are gonna be outside of these areas that we've quantified. But there's also gonna be folks in these areas that we said that are that are high risk okay. that, that may not be. But but you're, you're exactly right. I mean, this, is, this is almost just to kind of help you say, hey, we think between three and 4% are at like a, a very high or high risk. Gotcha. And so, you know, we, we have to start um, we have to kind of start somewhere, but but you're right that there's this does this does not necessarily mean that only in these areas do do you have someone you pr you should have you're definitely going to have a couple of people scattered, but it, it shouldn't be as widespread since we are looking at that lowest quintile. It would have it would have kind of caught it if it if it was more more customers in that census tract that yeah. fell into that category. All right, Mr. Harold, I got a question. Sure. All right. I grew up in that part of town where that red dot is, and I travel it frequently. And I see people with cable TV and satellite dishes. You know, we've got a, a necessity, but you know, is it is cable TV? What are they paying those bills? Or are they get cut off? I'm just saying maybe our water is took for granted, and we just get don't turn it off. I, I mean, these people. And not as, and I hate to say this, but south side of town has turned Hispanic, and there's 12, 14 people living, and they all go off to work every day. They don't stay at the house; they're under taxed labor. And I, I just, I have a problem with all of it. And when they don't pay the water bill and they go and do everything else, I, I just, I, I don't have no sympathy for them. Now, some people hardship cases, yes, but when we got people working every day. And they got cable TV and driving nice cars, and you know I, I just have a problem with when they don't pay the water bill. That's what I got to say. Might not be correct, but that's what I say. So, Wayne, why don't, well, you don't have to respond to that. I, I would I would ask the question. Uh, this is the uh, three point four percent are estimated to be at risk. This is not actual data. Is that correct? I mean, th this is this is based certainly on your on your service area. We literally took, like Will said, we we took every customer who we had, who we know as a water and sewer customer. We looked at their average water use within the census tract, and then we looked at the census information for the lowest quintile. So it it's it's done by it has to be done at the census tract level. So we certainly have to take a. Uh, an, an average, if you will, of that census tract. We can't look at it on a on an individualized basis because we clearly don't know the the income level of your individual customers. Yeah, so. I, I misspoke. So so look at since the top one, since it's the one that Mr. Day is talking about. Mm -hmm. You're not saying, or our billing department's not saying that 27% are delinquent. You're saying that that's a risk level. That that's right. That that's basically saying that that census tract, based on the lowest quintile income compared to their water sewer bill. And as Will said, they have a higher household. So we're assuming mm -hmm. obviously that means, you know, they're gonna use a little bit more water. So that puts more pressure on them. They have the lowest um, uh, quintile income and then their their water bill as a portion of that 
puts them at the highest risk category. So they're basically the ones that have the, the greatest need when we look, when we use this metric. Got it. Yeah. But that, that is, is a good, that's a good point to, for us to recognize that, you know, we can't do it on an individual level. So we, we certainly have to make some broader assumptions, but they're based on a census tract level. So it's as granular as we can get. Thanks for making that. Thank you. This is Alan Younger. Thanks for making that distinction that when we look at this, this is looking at household burden, not necessarily your students delinquent. But I would like to know if we have the ability to compare these census tracts to the, uh, the actual performance. I mean, are we seeing that people in these census tracts are, uh, are, are not paying their bills on time or we have them on payment plans or those sorts of things? Yeah, and, and we actually have the, um, we're gonna look at a delinquent map in, in just a minute. Okay, cool, I'll be patient. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. All, all very good questions. A question, a question for Courtney, I think on this one, but does our delinquent accounts numbers match the 3.4% shown here? Are we 3.4% delinquent? I think well, Elaine's getting ready to get there, Brian. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So Will, if you advance forward, we'll, um, we'll go. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna layer in some of the COVID, the COVID impacts. And just to kind of remind everyone, you know, some of the impacts of COVID on, on the practices is, you know, earlier, almost, almost a year ago, there was an executive order that suspended disconnections and late fees um, that weren't allowed again until the end of, end of July, basically. Um, you know, we didn't resume uh, late fees until November, and then um, termination notices have started going out January of, of 2021. So, so clearly, this has been a kind of an impact on our on practices as well. So, one of the things to to uh, the, this chart highlights a couple of things. The first is if we just kind of think nationally, obviously, all utilities have have had an increase in delinquencies. Um, on average, utilities saw a 28% increase in bills that were more than 30, 30 days past due. And as you'd expect, those with lower income have been impacted a lot more than those you know, that are at higher income. But the, the chart to the left is specifically for North Carolina and the UNC Environmental Finance Center did a survey. They wanted to understand the impact of COVID specifically on utilities. So what this chart shows you is on the on the left hand axis, it's it it represents the percent of customers with bills that are past due, and then on the um, uh, on the bottom axis you have the number of service connections. So the smaller the utility, the more to the left you are. The larger the utility, the more to the right you are. So Winston Salem is represented by the red. Um, star there, which has about, I think about 15% currently of customers have a, have a past due bill. And you'll notice that's in line with large, the other large utilities within North Carolina, because those to the very right represent the largest utilities with, you know, about 200,000 connections. So, so, you know, we're, we're not dissimilar from our other large peer utilities. Go to the next slide. So what we've done here in the next two slides, we have taken the same kind of mapping that we had done before, and what we've what we've added here are the delinquencies. So this shows all the delinquencies, regardless of amount, and you can see that um, you know they're they're spread throughout your service area. Um, again, this just kind of shows that the data point because we have in this case we do have every customer's. Um, delinquency information. So in other words, we've kind of just plotted, we know if they're delinquent, so we plotted it on, on, the, on the map. The next slide though is gonna tell you where those are concentrated from a dollar perspective. So what we did was, again, since we do have this information, the granular information by census track, we tallied up the, outs, the dollars outstanding in delinquencies so that you could see where it's concentrated. Um, so you'll see for, for the ones that we plotted here that are the most concentrated, you know, the average delinquent balance is about, um, about $300, you know, so that's basically saying that these customers are about six to eight months in arrears. 
And I'm in a minute, I'm gonna have Will jump back to the previous one because as you'll notice, you know, some of these match up to what we had before and then some of them, you know, some of them don't necessarily match up to where we to where we said, you know, folks were were um, uh, at risk. Elaine. Yes. Before you go there right quick, if you don't sure. mind. Yep. So these are households that are they're single family and not not rented. These are single family owned households. Okay. That's correct. All right. And we'll all have you bounce back again to slide 13. And, and obviously what will be, what we'll, you know, we'll want to monitor over time is in a, in a minute, we're going to talk about some of the, um, some of the funding that's out there that should help solve um, some of this problem, but then obviously be able to, you know, to see over time, you know, how hopefully this, um, you know, this, uh, this concentration um, is mitigated over time as some of this funding can reach some of these, some of these customers. Well, you can go back to the slide we were just on. Okay. Well, you um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So now we want to talk about how can we help these customers, and we're first going to talk specifically during COVID, because as as you're all aware, um, you know there's um, federal funding, you know there's state funding, and in particular. There's, there's really right now that we know of um, three different initiatives that are either going on or, or will go on. The first is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And um, this, this is funding that I think is available until the end of the year. That's gonna provide, I think, 8 million for the city of Winston-Salem, 4 million for Forsyth County. This goes to um, those that need assistance paying, you know, paying rent, or utilities. So th this this discussion kind of goes back to what Will had mentioned. While we did our analysis initially on you know just single family customers, we recognize that these programs as well as the ongoing programs certainly address both those that are multifamily customers that need assistance paying rent, a portion of which may be their water sewer bill, but also uh, those that are having difficulty paying utility bills, whether they're water, sewer, you know, gas, or electric. So the emer emergency rental assistance program is, is one. The HOPE program is another uh, program that has been administered through, I believe it's the United Way. That's also um, a mechanism to get assistance to those that need assistance paying rent and, and utilities. And another one that will be happening here soon, this is what the latest stimulus package was, uh, the setting aside of $638 million that's gonna be, that's gonna go directly to water and sewer utilities through the health and human services. Um, the, the challenge with all of this, not only for you know, Winston-Salem, but so many utilities across the country is, is in being able to to get you know get the money to the customers that need it, and part of that is because of the administration of this. So, in other words, um, uh, you know, being able to to partner with those agencies that already have um, the program and staffing in place to be able to connect these customers that that need this assistance. So, there is, I would say, relief that's coming. The challenge has and will continue to be making sure that. That that's you know funneled through existing programs and then and then ultimately gets to the to the individuals that need it. We go to the the next slide. There's also, as we know, you know, COVID has caused um, you know delinquencies to increase, but we also recognize that even post COVID, there still is always going to be an affordability challenge. So, so you know, what what do we intend to to do about that? And this kind of brings us back to those three areas again, where we could, we can, you know, provide assistance. Well, if you go to the next slide, is Elaine? Really, hey, yeah. Sorry, sure. I just wanted to quickly say about five more minutes or something. I just want to try to keep us on, okay. on schedule. So just 
but sure. you're there. Thank yep. you. Yep, no problem. Um, we're on the tail end anyway. Um, is really increasing awareness of our bill payment options. Uh, and, and currently are, have already done this, but can, can, can continue to do that. Um, tar targeted marketing, you know, making sure that those customers that we know that need assistance, letting them know about the ways that they can be assisted. They can be assisted through payment plans that are offered. They can be assisted through being connected to the nonprofit agency. So really getting that word out, whether it's social media, bill inserts, the customer service staff, redirecting them. And then secondly, what's happened lately is really strengthening the partnerships with the nonprofits. And Will, if you go to the next slide, these are currently the nonprofit agencies that, that we partner with. And um, you'll see these are the six listed. The five with the asterisk uh, beside their name are actually allowing citizens to donate and, they, and then they're earmarking the funds specifically for water and sewer bills. Um, range in the assistance from each of these entities varies from 75 to $266 per family. But um, Reggie helped gather some of this information and, and they did note that during COVID, they certainly have increased um, uh, that amount of assistance uh, to families. Again, it can be for rent or uh, paying water sewer bills or other utilities. And if we go to the, the next slide, there's also gonna be future technology, Courtney mentioned. Um, if you all have time, if I can hurry up, you can get potentially to AMI. Um, AMI uh, in, the, in the long term will help you. Currently you do bi-monthly billing. AMI will let you do monthly billing. That helps customers, it helps them budget better. It also helps them if they get behind, they're only behind one month and you can usually catch them up faster than when several bills accumulate. And then finally, with AMI, you will be able to have a, a customer portal that'll, that will allow customers to monitor their water use. They can try to reduce their water use and it, it'll help them catch leaks uh, quicker. And then finally, uh, designing um, affordable, affordable rates. Well, if you'll go to the, the next slide. Um, staff, we work with staff every year to look at the production of water and sewer rates for the upcoming year, as well as the next five we we'll continue to prioritize looking at the affordability of rates, looking at that fixed versus volumetric um, rate, looking at the tier one to, to, again, make sure that rates can continue to be affordable. And as, as I mentioned earlier, this gives us a baseline. And so as we look at how water and sewer rates may need to adjust in the future, using this analysis, we'll kind of know what that next level is that may be at risk of, of having unaffordable water and sewer service as well. So we can always gauge that in the future to see who, who else we may think may be at risk and also to see how our efforts have hopefully been able to connect those customers to where they need, where they can get assistance and hopefully hopefully control the, um, the affordability challenges that may be in the service area. I think there's just one last one. Um, uh, as we mentioned, there certainly are customers that that need assistance, but we, we don't see a, a widespread issue. Um, COVID is currently creating challenges. Funding's on the way. The, the, the key is gonna be to partnering with those agencies and making sure that funding can, can get to those that have these delinquent bills now and then in the future continuing to connect them. Um, and then continuing to, to assist them with bill payment options and, and connecting them uh, to these nonprofit agencies. I kind of stop there and see if there's any any other questions. Elaine, go ahead. Elaine, this is Chris Parker. One question I had was, have we done an analysis on the people we have disconnected? Like how long does that connection remain disconnected? Um, are, the, are these people repeatedly getting disconnected and reconnected? That is... That is something we haven't looked at uh, quite yet. I don't know if, if Courtney, if you all have ever looked at that historically. Yeah, and I don't, Mr. Parker, I don't know the, the answer to that. Mike Corvis is not on the phone today, but I can follow up with him and see if that's something that we've looked at or, or if we can look at. Okay, yeah, because I think that would be an interesting statistics because you, you really need to have water if you're going to live in a, in a house. So if you get disconnected, you know, what then happens? Thank you. Uh, Lane, thank you for this. Um, uh, could you go back one slide, please, Will? 
Oh, I'm sorry, one more. <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, design affordable rates, you know, we've been from a fixed charge coverage thing, uh, perspective, excuse me, trying to raise our readiness to serve charge as a component of the overall to, to have more stable revenue, which, which this slide implies is hurting on the affordability side. So is there a theory around if you have a certain level of uh, readiness to serve charge, then the volume metric can be pretty inexpensive in the tier one or two and then ramp up uh, marginally higher? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. That's, that's always the trade-off with um, that fixed component. Um, you know, you, you need it for debt coverage. It puts, it puts immediate pressure on, you know, the affordability of rates, but you're right. That's where you could monitor that first kind of tier um, it, it, with recognizing that then it, it will, if it, it'll then kind of shift that burden to the, you know, to the other, other tiers or, um, you know, or, or say irrigation. So you're, it's always kind of a balancing act, but, but you're right. That's, that's what that implies is kind of keeping an eye on that, you know, tier one to, to make up for that. And is that something I'm asking either you or Courtney that we would consider? So more of a, um, not a straight line tier, but a parabola, parabolic sort of tier approach. Yes, yes, we, you know, we will look at that and consider that when we're looking at our rates and, and affordability. And whether or not that would attack that 3.4% that uh, of folks at risk. Correct. Okay. We can look and, at that. And Courtney, this is Chris Parker again. As you're reaching back to Mike to get that question answer that I had, could you also find out of the people who are being disconnected, um, how many are renters versus actual owners of the property? Okay. Mr. Davis, do you have a question? Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got one question. These these nonprofits are going to help help our customers. Do they write a check out to the customer, or do they write it out to the utility to pay the water bill, or the Duke or whoever? Do we know that answer? I do. Uh, this is Damon. So, as far as the 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 ERAP, the emergency rental assistance, the checks get written directly to the utility. Okay. Um, through that process, and it, I believe that's the the case in most of those programs. It gets written directly to the utility, not the individual. So, so a customer, one of our customers, brings in the late water bills, and say Sunnyside Ministry writes a check to the city county utilities for the water, not to the correct. Customer. That is correct. That's correct. Now, this is Yvonne Huns. Um, as a nonprofit, I want to verify the checks do go to the agency and not the person. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there, if there if there are not any other questions, we will we will move along. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Oh, no, I call you Mr. Mr. Ford didn't get to say anything. I just wanted to make sure if he had anything he wanted to add in addition to Elaine or Will. Reggie, did you have anything? I don't know if he's. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to unmute. Uh, no, I didn't have anything, but that the information is correct. The uh, payment actually goes directly uh, to the uh, city versus the uh, person. So all of those uh, organizations have that in their requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Reggie. Thanks, folks. This is Wesley. Good to see you, man. <laughs> oh, same here, Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Will, if you can stop sharing your screen, I am going to share mine again so we can um, get Gordon to to go. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Elaine yes, and well Reggie. Done, well done. And uh, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay so um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen again. And Gordon, um, you're up. Gordon is our solid waste operations manager. 
and he'll be given a brief overview of our solid waste division. All right, thank you. Um, appreciate Courtney and Jan giving me the opportunity to talk to all you guys. That's probably been over a year since I first met you and haven't had a chance to be back. So uh, appreciate you giving me a chance to spread some of the knowledge I've learned since I've been here. Um, if you want, I guess we'll start out with saying, uh, as part of the utilities group, we have the solid waste division where we handle uh, disposal of unwanted garbage and, and things people don't want any longer. And we do that um, through our uh, MSW landfill, or our CND landfills, yard waste facilities and recycling um, centers that we offer and uh, help support. Um, and we do this as a means to meet state and federal regulations on what we're supposed to be doing with the garbage. Um, and of course, all of these facilities go through multiple permitting processes to, um, to make sure we're in compliance with our operations with the, with the regulations. Our uh, largest facility that we have is the Haynes Mill Road Landfill, uh, as pictured here. Um, it's the largest municipally owned uh, landfill in North Carolina. Um, the property itself has three uh, landfill units. The um, picture that you saw was the what's currently being operated and is referred to as a line expansion unit. And it's permitted to eventually be a total of 90 acres, but right now we're working within a 65 acre footprint. Um, the landfill uh, originally opened and the closed ones opened in 1972 um, and we currently have capacity uh, till about 2035. Um, and uh, on an average, I guess if you average out over the year of our six days of operation, it comes out to about 850 tons a day that we're disposing, but during the week it's probably closer to about 1,000 tons a day. When you first come into the Haynes Mill landfill, the first thing you're going to come across is the uh, scale house. Um, this is where everything gets weighed in. Uh, and we have two scales operating right now to deal with people that are being weighed. But we also have um, a flat rate side where customers with a uh, pickup truck or a car or a trailer can come across and pay a flat rate based on whatever type of vehicle they're bringing in. Um, it was a little bit confused about that when I first came to Winston-Salem because that's the first I've seen like a flat rate at a solid waste facility since you're supposed to weigh uh, your weights coming in but going through the research of, of how we came about that we actually do a good job of going back and um, typically annually doing a, a study where we weigh those vehicles and then average out uh, a weight so that we can apply it for each count and that helps to cut down on customers wait time in line So our larger haulers will work their way on back then to the landfill itself and up to the uh, working phase. Um, the size and shape of it can really help you or hurt you uh, in your efficiency at, at moving customers through and getting them out. Um, Typically, it's it's larger municipal trucks that will come in, and if you have it set up right, we can typically get five to six trucks in at a time uh, offloading. But we, for safety reasons, we need to leave uh, space between vehicles, typically 15 feet between each. So sometimes when you get big haulers like uh, construction demolition. Um, that's bringing in an 18 wheeler with a dump trailer on it. Um, a lot of times that'll shut your working face down to just that one vehicle because you got a picture, you have a, a trailer that's 40 feet up in the air. And if you, you want to allow for it to tip over, you kind of need to stand back and let everybody out. So that can lead to issues um, from an operation standpoint because you're backing up the line while you're waiting for that one vehicle to dump. Um, but anyhow, we, we compact that waste and then cover it daily. Um, also part of the landfill at the, at the front by the scale house, when you come in, there's a citizen drop off area. It was installed to, uh, to help you know, our residents that didn't wanna 
deal with the mud at the working face and this gives them a nice paved area to, to safely dispose of their um, their garbage and uh, I have noticed since I've been here um, through the pandemic that we've had some smaller almost seem like smaller haulers that are using a larger trailer and they'll uh, they'll they're starting to utilize this area as well and uh, being a hand unloader and it takes them quite a while to unload those trailers so it, that's been having some impacts uh, on our ability to move people in and out of the community area efficiently I'm sure many of you probably know but part of the of landfill also you need to have um, some control systems in place to protect the environment. Um, one of the big systems that we have currently at the landfill is the leachate collection system where it collects uh, water that makes its way down through the trash and sends it to our uh, the county's city county um, water treatment system. And what that does, it helps prevent the water from percolating down into the uh, to groundwater and contaminating people's drinking water around us. And then this, the landfill also has a, a gas energy system uh, where we collect gas from both the closed and active units. Uh, where, and then the gas is then sent to a generator where it produces electricity. Um, the recovered methane helps to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, and also helps to uh, maintain our surface emission requirements. But we, we are partnered with a contractor on operating that facility. So we are at their, um, sometimes at their mercy of actually operating their system correctly so that we maintain our compliance. And, the, and then we have some other uh, areas, uh, ancillary facilities at the landfill that help um, divert some waste from the landfill. Uh, one of them being the appliance and, and scrap metal recycling area where we take in refrigerators and stoves, dishwashers, that sort of stuff. And we'll have a contractor come in and, and remove the Freon from the um, refrigerators and air conditioning units so that the, the Freon doesn't escape into the atmosphere. Um, and part of the, the way that this program's paid for is there's a $3 fee applied to each appliance that's purchased um, within the state. And then that money gets redistributed back to the, uh, the different participating communities. A similar type thing uh, also exists with the um, tires, we run a program that's based off of a state program that collects a 2% fee uh, for tires that are on the rim 20 inches under and a 1% fee for anything over a 20 inch rim. Um, and that money again is redistributed back. And luckily, I believe uh, if and Jan can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe that the reimbursements we get from the state is actually enough to help fund our program here. Um, within Winston-Salem. Uh, our second uh, landfill facility that we have within the city is the Old Salisbury Road uh, C&D landfill. Um, it's on the south end of the county, almost, almost at the um, county line. Uh, and it only accepts construction demolition waste um, and inert debris. This facility there is about 56 acres and is uh, about 4 million cubic yards of capacity within it. Uh, the C&D landfill um, also uh, is an unlined facility unlike Haynes Mill, uh, the active unit up there. Um, and one of the big differences between uh, operations between the two is uh, I thought this was maybe something you guys would like to know is at Haynes Mill, we have to cover daily, whether it's with dirt or with a tarp, but at a C&D facility, since you're not taking putrescible waste and it's mostly inert, you can get away with only covering it once a week, so which helps save on airspace and uh, operations time. The uh, city also uh, operates and maintains two yard waste processing facilities, um, one at uh, Overdale 
and one at form 52. Um, we take in the um, leaves and brush and tree stumps and that sort of stuff. And it's managed through a contractor with uh, Wallace Farms and they'll take that material and send it through a big tub grinder and create mulch out of it. And then they haul that off to their facility um, for further distribution and processing. One of the big things um, at our yard waste facility uh, that we do annually is a uh, leaf mulch giveaway uh, that will take the leaves the city collects and uh, store them on site and turn them and turn them into a mulch. Uh, and that's set to begin um, Friday, April 2nd, and then there'll be four Saturday events. That'll be April 3rd, 10th, 17th, and 24th. beyond our active um, areas that are making money and, and having to be managed daily, the city also has long-term um, debt, basically, that, that will be tied up with um, closed sites. The, the city currently has four different facilities that are, that are closed. One is at Overdale, one's Ebert Road, one's at Bowman Gray, and then the biggest one that we have is uh, 143 acres here at Haynes Mill Road. The one at Haynes Mill Road is, is half of it's unlined and the other half, uh, which is referred to as a piggyback, was aligned and then capped. The other three sites are all unlined. Um, and then we have gas collection systems at, uh, at um, Haynes Mill, at uh, Ebert Road, and at Bowman Gray. And one of the things that I like to point out to people whenever we're, uh, I talk to them about closed landfills is the, the regulations say that you need to uh, maintain and monitor those landfills for 30 years. And there's some caveats in there that could basically extend that. And in reality, you're gonna be monitoring and maintaining these things forever. Um, I think when the 30 year, what I've been told by people older in the industry that were around when a lot of the regs were developed was that the 30 year was kind of a, a number that was thrown out there to get people past the point of uh, arguing about how long you need to do it. It was agreeable to everybody and everybody thought, well, I'll be retired in 30 years. I'll let those people figure it out at that point. So uh, we're, we're there at a lot of places. So. Um, one of the two of the there's this slide and the next are two uh, also contracted um, options that we provide citizens for disposing of household hazardous waste and electronic waste, and that's through our uh, contract with three three RC Environmental and Fire Station. I'm sorry, um, and the cost of the ha household hazardous waste collection program is actually fully funded through reimbursement from the stormwater water and wastewater divisions within the city. And that's, I think, I like that setup that actually works well because what it does is it, they're the ones that benefit from not having the stuff dumped down your drain and into the storm sewer system and having to deal with it. And then again, the, the we also offer uh, electronic waste collection at 3RC and uh, a small part of that is reimbursed through the state e-waste trust fund. But um, uh, if it's, I haven't delved a lot into it, but I know a lot of uh, other places have been, it's still a substantial amount that isn't covered by that fund. Uh, we also have several other recycling services. Um, Two of them, we have the drop-off recycling sites and the uh, school recycling that are um, off, off our uh, facilities. And then we have what we touched on earlier, but with the scrap metal recycling and the tire recycling. We also have two areas, um, one at Haynes Mill, and one at Old Salisbury Road, where we recycle concrete, asphalt, and brick, where we'll take and have it uh, basically smashed into smaller pieces and we use that for road base. So it helps to defer our costs on buying stone for, for our roads within the landfill. Um, 
and we do have three uh, drop off recycling facilities within the county. Um, Kernersville, one here at Haynes Mill Road and uh, Poff Town. And uh, those are actually um, managed by the county, um, but the city has the contract with waste management. So we get the bill and pay the bill and the county reimburses us for that. Um, and that's something that we're looking into uh, passing that all off to uh, the county in the near future. That is it. Thank you, Gordon. Um, are there any questions for, for Gordon before we? Uh, this is Harold. This is Harold. I got a question about all this methane collection. Some of y'all not old enough to remember over on Silas Creek at the National Guard Armory. We do a lot of monitoring everywhere else, but we had soldiers killed one day for methane gas, and all we saw right now is PVC pipe sticking up out of the ground. And I think we've forgot all about what happened back in the history. I just want to mention that. Okay, uh, thank you. Go ahead. Some... Gordon, Gordon, this is Chris Parker. I have a question about the like yard waste. Do we charge the city when they drop off yard waste the same that we would charge a private company? like a landscaping firm if they were to drop off yard waste? Uh, to be honest, I don't know the, the answer to that. I believe it is the same. I think Haynes Mill is the only one where we give a discount for a higher volume. Um, Jan may know the answer to that. Jan, yeah. do you know? Yes, the answer is yes. The tip fee at the two yard waste sites is $32 per ton currently, and all the customers pay that. So whether it's a city or it's a private business, it's the same? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, and I, I, this may be a little off in a Damon type of question, but I have noticed that there are a lot of landscaping companies who I believe are supposed to haul away their own yard waste who are just putting it out at the street for the city to collect. Is there any type of enforcement on that? Uh, good afternoon again, Chairman, members of the commission. So the short answer, Mr. Parker, is no. Uh, if you're a city resident and um, and you place the brush, no matter who who cut it at the curb, that's a service we provide. Now, what we haven't been doing is really enforcing the city code um, to the to the extent that it's written. So, for example. Anything that's greater than six inches in diameter or six feet in length, we've been collecting for years and years. And so moving forward, I think we're going to try to start limiting that. But, but you're right. I mean, it's very simple to have the landscaper, you know, take that, take that away. Um, I think the carrot that they dangle is, well, the city will come get it if I just, if I just leave it here. So we're going to try to do is start enforcing the code more strictly and that'll start to reduce the amount of brush that's left on the curbside. Okay, well, the point I'm getting at is you've got the landscapers who I believe are doing the right thing by hauling the brush away, and then you've got others who are just putting it out of the street. And I understand, I do my own yard, so I would want to be able to put it out of the street, but as far as in a, in a fairness standpoint toward those uh, landscapers who are doing the right thing, uh, there's a lot of others out there or not, which then means that we don't really have an equitable cost of business on that. Agreed. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so next on the agenda was a break, and um, I'm I'm good to keep going. Um, but uh, if anybody wanted to just, I'll, I'll wait, um, Chairman Tuttle. I'll maybe defer to you. I think we should keep going unless I, I think, uh, does anyone have a problem if we keep going? Hearing none, Courtney, please proceed. Okay. okay. I, I, I want us to keep going too. I've got a hard stop uh, at 215. Okay. Okay. Well, next on um, the agenda is the, uh, is our agenda, our items. So um, I will go through those quickly. Um, First item on the agenda, agenda is the approval of the minutes from the February meeting. 
Um, second item or item number two is a resolution authorizing acquisition of easements by deed or condemnation for the sewer replacement and stream stabilization project. The scope of work includes replacement of existing sanitary sewer, stream crossing, sewer easement, access clearing, bypass pumping, riprap, and site restoration. There was a site that's in need of immediate uh, repair, and it was added to the project after the original uh, land acquisition process happened. So we need to go back and get this piece. There are five affected properties at a cost of $3,700. All right, item number two, or I'm sorry, item number three is a resolution awarding a contract for valve condition assessment. Utilities field operation has the need for a vendor before, to perform water valve locating and operating services. There are 42,776 known valves of various sizes um, with, uh, according to our GIS data. The selected firm will provide the personnel and equipment to locate, identify, clean out, inspect, mark, perform minor repairs if possible and operate these valves within our distribution system. Um, we wanna start with, with two phase, or we wanna start with a phase and then have ultimately have two phases. Phase one will be a, a thousand valves in the estimated amount of $100,000 in a timeline of four months. If the vendor um, meets expectations, we would offer another contract for the remaining um, valves. And we would have the right to, to go to the next highest qualified uh, responder if we were not satisfied with the first vendor. Based on the evaluation panel's assessment, it's recommended that a contract for the valve condition assessment be awarded to Hydromax in the estimated amount of uh, $1,743,038. One thing that we need to do on um, this item is we do need to revise the resolution as it's written. The resolution as it is written is, says that we would award one contract and we actually need to award two contracts to be able to do it as a phase one and phase two. So it would be authorizing phase one contract in $100,000 and then phase two would be conditioned um, for the remaining amount. Uh, a second contract would be conditional upon the successful completion of phase one for the remaining amount. So, um, Marilena, I don't know if they when they make when they go through to make the um, the approval, we just need to somehow mention that in the in the motion. Yes, so um, the commission is going to vote on the resolution in item three as revised, as explained by staff. So that's what um, the commission would need to say, and then there'll be the vote as usual. And again, that first contract is for the phase one pilot program for a thousand valves in the estimated amount of $100,000 in a timeline of four months. And then if Hydromax um, uh, meets expectation, then they would go on and get that second contract for phase two for the balance of the contract amount um, over uh, up to five years. And so again, the commission would just have to say that they're voting on the revised resolution um, as explained by staff now. Thank you. Uh, Courtney, mm -hmm. Tom, question. Uh, can we use that type of technique on other types of contracts, for example, construction of a pump station or something like that? Uh, I, I, so I think we can use it on um, other type of contracts. I'm not sure that it would work so much on a construction project because they're bidding a, a, an amount of work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, you tell me if you think. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's correct. And, and I can look into it further and, and get back to you uh, later, but I, but I think that's, uh, that's a true statement. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a better fit on a service type contract like yeah. this than it is on an individual project basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, item number four. I'm sorry, this is Charles Wilson. I had a quick yeah. question about the previous item. Okay. On Hydromax's assessment, they got the max score on qualifications and experience with similar projects. 
but their program understanding got kind of a mediocre grade. So if they have all this experience and qualifications, why would their understanding be low? I will, that's a good question. And let me, uh, Mike Stover, are you able to answer that one? Uh, not in, in probably the detail Mr. Wilson's looking for, um, the, you know, the criteria for the RFP w was set up in such a manner where you get points for work experience and uh, understanding the project. And, and there's a panel of, of several uh, in-house staff, usually five to seven folks. And, and project understanding is a very qualitative uh, type criteria that people can, can score differently. And I don't know why it was scored in a manner in which it was, but I can find out. I mean, I can see how it would be subjective. It just seemed like it was somewhat at odds with the you know, highest score for qualifications and experience. This is I Wesley. don't have an answer why it was scored where it was. This is Wesley. Sometimes that can be just a matter of how you answer the questions. Okay. <laughs> some, some, I mean, really, some people are better at saying, you know, what it is they're good, trying to say that you get a better impression about they understand what that is versus somebody that may have, do, may have done it for 30 years, but they just don't know how to say that. <laughs> and I, I don't think we have anybody on the call that was on this panel other than, I don't, and Jakira, I don't know if she... Um, has any detail regarding that, but, but we can definitely find out, but I don't think we have anybody on the call. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next item is item number four, and this is a resolution awarding a contract for mowing services at water treatment facilities. So the purchasing department issued a request for proposal to provide pricing for mowing and landscaping of our water uh, treatment facilities and proposals were received from six contractors. Upon initial review, uh, the proposal submitted by Advanced Property Solutions, Harper Landscaping and Grading, and CAM Contracting LLC failed to meet the mandatory requirements of the specifications, rendering their proposals as non-responsive. Creative Construction received the highest score. However, the pricing that they submitted substantially ex exceeded our annual budget amount. Therefore, that proposal was rejected. So it is recommended that a contract for mowing services um, at our water treatment facilities be uh, awarded to Crawford Landscaping, who, who was the second highest score uh, uh, in the estimated amount of $78,784. In terms of the, the proposal, reserve the right for the commission to extend these, this service contract for as many as two additional 12-month periods if both parties agree for a total a potential total estimated contract value of $236,352. I've got a question on that, Courtney. Is this the one we're awarding is not the real high when it was on the uh, one on the breakdown of the number four? Yes, yeah, so we are not the the we are not awarding it to creative design and construction. They were the highest score, but they had a the price that they submitted was well over our budget amount. And so we are going with the second highest firm. And, they, and that second high, is that like double the other bids? I, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now. So um, I know that that Crawford is, gave an annual amount of $78,784. Um, I believe that Creative Design was over $200,000. Well, that's what I think I remember, yeah. So we don't have to buy this company a, a lawnmower and a, and a weed eater, do we? <laughs> hey, Courtney, this is Chris Parker. Is Crawford who we currently have the mowing contract with? Yes, that is correct. They are the current incumbent. And we've been satisfied with their work. Yes, we have. Okay. I'm very pleased with their work. Okay, item number five is a resolution authorizing the transfer let me pull up the map. Transfer of funds to cover the cost of certain utility expenses related to the Novak Street Bridge replacement project. This is an existing bridge 
um, over Mill Creek and it's closed currently to traffic due to structural deficiencies. A design was has been prepared and bids received to remove and replace the existing bridge. The new bridge alignment uh, will require that the existing water main be re relocated. Um, it does not require that the existing sewer line be re relocated, but the excavation of the bridge will require that we add an additional steel pile as a support for the sewer line. So the construction cost for the related uh, water, the water related items is estimated to be $65,900 and the construction cost for the sewer related items is SM estimated to be $52,500. Any questions on that one? Okay. Item six is a resolution authorizing the execution of an amendment to the engineering agreement with Highfield Infrastructure Engineering for design, bidding, and construction administration services for the Roswell lift station project. The commission approved an engineering agreement with Highfield in October 2016 for this work for $469,100. The Roswell lift station project is currently under construction and is scheduled to be complete in April of this year. The initial contract completion date was February of this year. To date, there have been multiple amendments totaling $99,000. For additional design, permitting, and easement services for rerouting the sewer line along Rockford Road. Additional bidding services due to the project being rebid three times and um, additional construction administration services. All the current amendments to date have been approved within the city manager's authority. Due to the addition of two more months to the construction duration, we need <clears throat> an approval for an additional amendment in the amount of $39,300. And since this, this change order takes the total of all change orders above the city manager's um, authority, the utility commission will need to, uh, we need approval from the utility commission for this last change order. So Courtney, this is Chris Parker. This, this item six on the Roswell lift station project, um, it, it, now is this the one down in Clemens that we're, that we've got some money from the county that is helping us out with? So, um, it is in Clemens, but it is not funded by uh, the county. It's it's a utility well, commission Courtney, project. This, Courtney, this is the one in Kernersville, not I'm, Clemens. I'm sorry. I was thinking Kernersville, but he said Clemens. Thank you. This is, uh, Kernersville. Yeah, this is the Kernersville one. Yes. Thank you. So the one and that it, Mike Sturber decided to bury 10 feet underground, you know, really deep. That's, right. That's the to one. To make the neighbors happy. Yeah, this is up off of Piney Grove Road. We, we had several um, presentations about this probably two years back, Mr. Parker, regarding the alignment. Have we, have we made that woman happy out there? Was mad at us at Roswell? No, but we're, we're, we're getting through there. <laughs> you should be happy. <laughs> we're we're doing the best we can to keep all the the property owners happy, but we're we're getting really close to being done. Chris, did you get your question answered? Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you. And I heard heard Clemens, but I had Kernersville in my mind. So thank you for correcting me, Saver. Um, okay, so item seven is. Um, a resolution approving a change order with Renolda Electric Company. This contract uh, was issued to provide on-call repairs to various electrical systems at the water and wastewater within the water and wastewater division. Uh, the work was advertised and bid by the purchasing department. The initial purchase order was in the amount of fourteen thousand nine hundred dollars. During this fiscal year, there have been multiple change orders totaling $81,240.69 for electrical system repairs that have been approved within the city manager's authority. There have been additional unforeseen electrical repairs needed at the biosolids drying facility and the Muddy Creek wastewater treatment plant, totaling $68,759.31. And again, since this latest change order um, takes the total amount um, over the city manager's authority, the utility, we need the utility commission's approval for this change order in the amount of $68,759.31. Uh, Courtney, this is Chris Parker. So this work for $68,000 has not been done yet. Correct. That is correct. How, 
how do we make a decision on whether we're going to make it a change order at this level or whether we're going to go put it back out to bid? Because it looks like initially the bid was pretty small, less than 15000 and now we're getting to 10 times that much. Yeah, so this is this is really for services. It's not construction um, um, items. So it's an RFP. It's a request for a proposal that we use to select the vendor, and it's an on-call service agreement with Renolda. So we try to um, determine how much we'll need each year, but without also encumbering a large amount of funds that we may or may not need. So we've, we obviously need more this year than what we had set up the original uh, PO for, purchase order for. And um, so that's why we're, it's a significant amount of, of change. But it's, a, it's different than a construction, like a hard bid construction contract. Does that answer your question? Well, would we have the option of putting this out for bid? Um, well, I think, and, and Jerry, you chime in if I'm wrong. I think I think cost was was a factor when we selected them, but it's not the it's not because it's a service contract. It's not the total. It's it's only a piece of what we use to evaluate the vendor. So we went through the process of selecting yep. Renolda when we did this at the beginning of the year. And we went through the evaluation process and, and selected Renolda to be our own call provider, electrical provider. Let me take a stab at that. And Mr. Parker, you can, we could, you can bid out anything that you'd like to. Um, in this case, we have a, a qualified um, service provider who we've already previously selected, as Courtney said. And so if you bid it, that's very time consuming and may or may not result in a cost savings. Um, so I suspect that staff in this case just said, we, we know who we have, the quality of work that they do. So we'll, we'll negotiate a change order to what we have in place versus bidding the project out. And if I could add one last thing, um, the, one of the responsibilities of the purchasing department is to please department's activities on change orders. And so <clears throat> what we were, uh, enlightened on in this project is the department really desired to not put a larger amount of money in their purchase order. They didn't want to encumber those funds in their purchase order in case they didn't need them. We went back over the last two years since this, uh, since Renalda was awarded this contract and the average expenditure has been in the neighborhood, I believe was in the neighborhood of 30 to $50,000 per fiscal year. Uh, I think the reason, and Mike might have to, Mike Stover might have to correct me on this, but I think the reason we, we have a couple of situations that have occurred that we need to take immediate action on, which uh, which uh, complies with the uh, on call piece of this project. <clears throat> they really need to get those com projects accomplished, and the initial estimates have driven it over the manager's authority again. And therefore staff decided rather than continuing to do the change orders, they looked at what they anticipate needing between now and the end of the fiscal year, June 30, and estimated a cost that would keep them from having to bring this item back in the next few months. Mike? <laughs> I'll chime in real quick. The way this is set up, it's intended to be an on-call electrical services contract. So we issue a PO, and we put roughly $3,000 per plant, and there's five plants, and we and I believe we put another $3,000 for the dryer into a, into a PO each fiscal year. We don't know where those um, services are going to be needed. They might be at one plant. They might be at all plants but we don't want to encumber a ton of funds up front. So we, we, we do that initial PO and then we do change orders as the need arises. So we can make sure from an accounting standpoint that we're pulling the money out of the right buckets. This year uh, has, has been uh, out of the ordinary in the sense that there's been a lot of electrical services repairs that we don't have time to, to, to bid out. That's the, the nature of this contract. We have a, piece of equipment that is, has failed and needs to be serviced or repaired, you know, quickly to get it back in service. And that's what the intent of this work is for. Does that answer your question at all, Mr. Parker? 
It, yeah, it does. I, I guess my only concern is is when we look at bidders, there might be an electrical uh, contractor that this wouldn't bother for fifteen thousand, but we might have a more robust number of bidders if they knew it was going to be one hundred and fifty thousand, because there's time and effort whenever these uh, people have to put in to put forth a bid. I just want to. I just want to make sure you know we're getting the best bang for our buck on this, and I do understand the importance with electrical work that you need to get it done. But going from people bidding on a fifteen thousand dollar contract and suddenly they've got one hundred and fifty thousand, I just think there might have been a broader pool of contractors that would have been willing to participate in that. Understood. And, and Commissioner, I, I can assure you that when we put this project out for bid, the intent of an on-call is, is evenings and weekends when it is, in fact, an emergency. And we asked them for an approximate number of hours that they would be performing these duties based on its historical hours, and we're looking for their hourly rates. Uh, on-call uh, on -call agreements are probably one of the most difficult projects that we have to bid out. Uh, because for the simple reason that you can have someone quote uh, an hour's worth of work at $100 an hour and the next person could quote, uh, it would take them an hour and a half, but they're $75 an hour. So you can't just look at the price perspective. We look at, we put heavily on the price, but also heavily on their previous experience of getting in there, getting the, getting the performance done and out. And so it's a very difficult thing, but I can assure you that original bid that we put out on the street did not equate to $15,000. We asked them for an estimated amount of hours, which would have been, you know, if we had totaled that out, would have been substantially greater than $15,000. We, hopefully okay. that helps a little. Yeah, that does. And, and so you're telling me that that dollar rate that we negotiated is standing in these estimates for these change orders. Yes, sir, I am saying that. The dollar per hour. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our last item is item eight, and this is a resolution approving a contract amendment with census for large meter replacement. The Utility Commission approved a contract in March of 2015 with O'Brien Southern Trenching for the first phase of the large meter replacement rehabilitation project. During the, during the five year contract period of this first phase, 203 inch and larger meters were replaced at a total cost of $2,206,317. There are approximately 30 remain, not 30, 300 remaining locations mm -hmm. where the infrastructure associated with the larger uh, water connections need to be rehabilitated. The commission approved a master's product, a master products and service agreement with census for our AMI program. And the scope of work um, for census was distribution system related work primarily associated with water connections two inches and smaller. So since we have selected census as our, our, our metering, our meter vendor, we have asked a census to provide a price to perform this type of work. Uh, with a large water meter replacement rehab project to, to cover the remaining 300 uh, connections. Staff negotiated a fee of $2,932,118, which is consistent with pricing for services of this nature. And the scope and fee uh, would be uh, added to the census uh, contract via an, an amendment. Is there any questions on that one? Okay. okay. Um, we have eight agenda items. Do any of the commission members would like to pull any of the agenda items uh, out of a consent agenda motion? Uh, this is Charles Wilson. I believe I may need to recuse on three, six, and eight as census is a tenant on the roof at Winston Tower and High Fill Engineering as a tenant of ours at another building. So perhaps I'll not vote on those on a consent agenda. Do you have any, Marlena, can you advise relative to conflicts and recusals? Um, so it sounds like there might be a, um, a financial conflict of interest there. So if you could vote to excuse the commissioner from uh, voting on those three items, that would be great. And on three, since this was the non-winning bidder, so I don't know if it would apply equally to that one, but um, yeah. 
I'm hearing a motion from Mr. Wilson that he be uh, uh, recusal on three agenda items. Do I hear a second? Second. Um, any other commission members desire, before we vote on that, to pull any items? Uh, Randall, if I could get a clarification on this. This is Chris. So does that mean if we were to vote totally consent agenda, um, then are, are we going to need to to actually vote separately on these items three, six, and eight. I believe, I'm yeah. ready to be corrected, yeah. that, that we'll vote on Mr. Wilson's motion, which allows him to recuse on three items, and then we'll vote on all the consent agenda. So if I vote yes, it just won't, three, six, and eight, just won't have my, okay. right? He won't be counted. Exactly. Right, right. I just wanted Marlene to clarify for us. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Okay, so we're voting on the uh, uh, Mr. Wilson's motion where he's recused for three agenda items. Uh, yes or no, Mr. Mr. Younger? Yes. See, I'm going into, um, Wes, I'm going in opposite order. I tricked you. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Stewart? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Jernigan? Yes. Ms. Hyde? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Day? Yes. And Mr. Curtis? Yes. That motion passes. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve agenda items one through eight via consent agenda. Move. Uh, one through eight, and consent agenda. Uh, excuse me, I am so sorry, commissioners. Um, could you vote on the, the item number three separately? I'm sorry. Um, and then in the vote, could you please vote, uh, state that you are voting on the resolution for item number three as revised as explained by staff? Make a motion that we vote on item number three based on the uh, recommendation of staff. Second. Any discussion on that motion? Mr. Curtis? Yes. Mr. Day? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Ms. Hines? Yes. Mr. Jernigan? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. I think Mr. Wilson is recusing himself, so I am not calling on him. Mr. Younger. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that motion passes. I would now entertain a motion for consent agenda items one, two, four through eight. Move approval for that. Second. Long second, uh, any discussion? Reversing the order, Mr. Younger. Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Jernigan? Yes. Ms. Hines? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Day? Yes. And Mr. Curtis? Yes. Thank you. Um, those agenda items passes. Courtney, back to you. We're 14 minutes late. Sorry. That's that's quite all right. I think what we'll just do is do our financial updates and we'll finish after that. So, um, okay. let me, okay. So our, um, Mike Corvesto went through these very quickly at last month's meeting, but our water and wastewater revenues um, uh, were slightly higher, our revenues are tracking higher than last year and ahead of the projected budget. We have uh, have an additional 1.7 million in system development fee revenue compared to the same time last year. And overall consumption is up 3% um, year to year. Water and wastewater expenditures are, expenditures are slightly higher than at the same time last year, but still under budget through the first eight months of the fiscal year. Past due balance history, you can see in the blue, this is our current past due amount. 
compared to the orange bars, which is our past two previous years. You can see at the beginning of the pandemic, we had around 3.3 million of past due balance balances and then it has steadily increased to a max in October of around 5.6 million where it held steady around 5 million for a few months but um, we are seeing uh, the trend go down now at 4.7 month uh, 4.7 million in February so that trend is in the right direction um, and Courtney those are that is due to payments right we're not writing off anything right that is correct Courtney, this is Chris. Have you done any type of analysis with with all the relief projected relief money that's coming in? How that may impact us? So it's gonna it's hard to do that analysis because we don't exactly know how much relief our customers are going to get. They have the opportunity to apply for the different programs, the Hope and the um, Emergency Rent, Rental Assistant Program, but we're just not sure how much we're going to see from that. Are we putting any efforts into marketing this? Yes, we are. Okay, so um, this graph shows our delinquent accounts. Again, starting in April at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we had a number of accounts. We saw that trend increase. Uh, December was at the highest of 18,000, but we're seeing you know it decrease uh, as we are with the past due balances. So in February, the average for customers, their account was $343 of, of delinquent uh, amount per account. Currently, we have around 1,500 active payment plans with an outstanding balance of $860,000. Um, so we're seeing a, a downward trend there too, as well. The, um, this is a budget versus projected, uh, revenue. After the pandemic had started, we adjusted our projected, uh, our, our budgeted revenues and decreased them based on our assumption of what impacts we would see from the pandemic. So our, our budgeted revenues was 111 million. Now that we we're eight months within the year, we, we, we feel like our projections will be around 118 million. We think we'll, we'll bill that much revenue. Again, that's billed, that's not collected. Um, if you look at this graph and, and just assuming that we, our, our past due balances stays at 4.7, you know, and it doesn't get worse, but hopefully it'll get better. We still had about a, a buffer of around 2.3 million um, between what we budgeted and what, what we actually will bill. And then of course, what we bill, we, sh we won't write off because unless they're an inactive account. So we'll eventually collect that money. It just will take, it'll take some time. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. She's gonna give um, the balance sheet, the water and sewer balance sheet update um, next. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Tuttle and um, members of the commission. Um, the um, slide you see here is the balance sheet for the water and sewer fund. Um, it is for December the 31st, 2020, as compared to the end of the fiscal year. So it's first six months of this year compared to last year. A lot of things we don't adjust as far as accruals until the end of the fiscal year. So you're gonna see some of these numbers are the same, but they're the accrued numbers. I'm just gonna point you to the things that are important. Um, first item is cash. Our cash was 99 million unrestricted at the end of December compared to 74.5 um, at the end of June. Primarily that is um, because of uh, investment income, which you'll see on the next page. Um, another note is that we don't make our principal payments on our debt until June 1. We make semi-annual interest payments and only an annual principal. So um, we haven't made any principal on our debt as of December 31. So that's why you see such a, um, a large growth there in the cash balance. Um, our receivable balance is 19.3 versus 14.6. Courtney's really already talked about this, but um, you know we have a higher consumption this year, which means we have higher bills outstanding. Um, um, so, and then the difference would be the, um, the amount of uncollectible that's greater this year that we just talked about um, versus last year at this point in time. So bottom line, our assets are 1.1 
million um, versus one, about the same as they were last year. Um, deferred inflows and outflows, again, that's an accrued number. We want to adjust till the end of the year. Um, and basically all of our payables are the same way. We don't make any of those payments um, other than our accounts payable. So our net position at the end of uh, December 31 is 605 million. Okay, you turn the page. Um, this is just a comparison again, six months to 12 months. So just think of the December 31 column as roughly doubling it. Um, and you can tell our water and sewer revenues are running, as Courtney said, uh, much better than we expected. You can see if you just you know increased water um, at the six months compared to a year, we'd be running about 11% above, sewer so 10%. So our revenues are looking strong. Um, our revenues are strong and our operating expenditures, um, you know, are holding steady. So, um, um, and again, like I said, we don't make principal payments to, uh, to June. So, you know, bottom line, I think we, we look good and there's not a lot to be concerned about at this point. Any Thank questions, you, Lisa. I'll be glad to answer. And we'll run through the solid waste revenues real quick. And then Lisa, we'll get back. Go ahead. Before you do, I just want to say great meeting. I have to run to get to another one. Take care. Thank Bye. you. So solid waste revenues. Um, the revenue is tracking below the budget and behind this, the same time last year. So so Jan is keeping a close eye on that, but they are, it is below um, what we've seen in the past. Expenditures, the expenses are um, are up this year, around 300000 compared to previous year. Some, some items are down like fuel, but the big ticket items that have increased this year, our yard waste contract is about $200,000 more. That's because more materials coming in. Our temporary labor cost is up because of more usage and higher hourly rates. That's the city increased the minimum wage. Um, scrap tire contract is up. We've got more incoming tires. And then we've had some unexpected breakdowns uh, for, with equipment. And so that, that cost is up as well. Still up compared to last year, but below our budget. And then I will turn it over, at least do the same thing on the solid waste side. Sure. Unrestricted cash at um, December 31 was right at 32 million as compared to 27.5 at the end of June. Again, investment returns um, were up about 3 million, which um, increased our cash. Um, since we were talking about solid waste today, as a reminder, that restricted cash number of $20 million is offset by the landfill closure and post-closure liability that's on the liability section of the balance sheet. And that's where we do set aside money for closure and post-closure for all of the closed landfills. Um, other than that, the numbers look very similar to June 30th, and we are in a net position of $58 million at the end of December. Revenues compared at six months to um, last year were right at 5.7. One thing to note here is a lot of the revenues are posted internally and they run, they run about a month behind. So you're really looking at five months of revenues in December. So it's not down as much as it would appear um, as you see on, on um, the statement here. Um, our operating income is about a half million compared to 1.1. Again, we don't make principal payments to the end of the year, and our investment income was um, rounds to about 3.2 million. Um, so, 58 million um, is our net position at the end of um, December 31, 2020. Okay, so that's that is all. Um, do you have any questions about any financial updates? for Lisa or me. Okay. So, um, Chairman, we are, we are complete and you can, <laughs> I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> Hold on, you're on mute. All right, do you want to, thank you, mention anything about AMI just in a minute or two or save that for next meeting? Well, I, I will just say that that we are, you know, well underway with our installation of the meters and the radio base stations. And so um, we will be planning on bringing an, an item to the commission next month to, to move forward in the next phase of the contract. And right now we are trying to determine, you know, we had, we brought you a kind of a smaller version of a contract with census, just to be mindful of our spending. We didn't want to encumber too much funds and overcommit ourselves, not knowing what our financial outlook would, would look like. 
And now that we feel more comfortable with, with where our revenues are going, um, we potentially um, could bring it back the, the remainder of the contract uh, next month for your, for your approval. Okay. All right. Any uh, commission members have anything they want to uh, say or address before we close? Mr. Day. I'd like to make a motion and we get done with this. Second. I got things to do. All right, we have Mr. Curtis at a second. Uh, yay yeah, or nay, Mr. Curtis? Uh, yay. Okay, and Mr. Day? Yay. Mr. Griffin? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Hines? Yes. Mr. Jarnigan? Yes. Mr. Long? No. <laughs> I, I saw him. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. And uh, that motion passes. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon, wonderful week. Don't forget to set your clocks ahead in six days. Yep. Bring Bye. it here. Bye. Thank Good you. Bye. Good evening, Courtney.